escape my bride. Let's go for a ride in my new fangled automobile. Just where we will go, nobody knows, but it's sure a great way to feel. Behind the wheel of a speed me to steal, it's my new fangled automobile. Hello and welcome to Vintage Car History. I'm Wild Bill. Auto racing is, of course, a sporting competition and rivalries between the participants and their associated fans is inevitable. The recent movie, Ford vs. Ferrari, depicts a typical rivalry. Two owners of car manufacturing companies try outdoing each other on the racetrack. In this case, the owners hired drivers to race their cars. Such rivalries litter the auto racing landscape. Bugatti vs. Alfa Romeo, Mercer vs. Stutz, Fiat vs. Peugeot. Where they're on the racetrack, the fans know that a real race is going to happen. And when auto racing first began in the 1890s, the first make of car to prove itself as the one to beat was, of course, Panhard and Levisor. And it was two French brothers who would build the car that would create auto racing's first true rivalry, Louis and Emile Moore. They were born in Paris, France, Louis in 1855 and Emile in 1859. The family owned a company that manufactured electric components, wires, capacitors, inductors, switches, and such. And so it should come as no surprise that the brothers grew up to be electrical engineers. Both excelled in their schooling and brought their skills home, expanding the family business and by the 1880s were manufacturing telegraphs and telephones as well. But when Leon Serpile began to ride around in his steam car, the brothers heard about it and decided to get into making cars. Now it may seem a bit odd that two electrical engineers would set about making a steam car, but that is what they did at first. It was a good design though. Rack and pinion steering, though it did use a tiller. Gas fired boiler and rear mounted engine with direct drive. It had no transmission. They showed this car at the ubiquitous 1889 Paris World's Fair and it got some attention and generated orders. A total of seven were built. Though this steam car had a bit of success, neither of the brothers were very happy with the results and so began to consider other options. And after much consideration, decided to make their next car powered by a gas engine. Yes, it may seem odd that two electrical engineers that own a company building electric things didn't go for an electric car. But at that time, they had their fingers on the pulse of the world of electric power and decided instead to use electricity and other innovations to make gas cars better. But I digress. They established the Société d'Automobile Moor in Paris by 1895 and unveiled their first gas car later that year. The five horsepower engine, designed by Emile, was among the first V4 engines ever built. Air cooled, though it did have a water jacket around the cylinders. Lubrication was through a dry sump as opposed to the total loss, and it supported an ignition system that he patented, the coil dynamo. The dynamo, which is basically a generator for DC or direct current, provided power to the coil, which would discharge into whichever cylinder needed it via a distributor and when there's enough power to spare it would charge the battery. When built it was the most advanced ignition system on any car in the world and is still the basis of modern ignition systems. The transmission was not particularly spectacular. A two-speed belt system driving chains that was pretty much a copy of the earlier Benz system but the car was very reliable for its day and so the brothers decided to advertise this new car and take it to the races. Now let's talk about the advertising first. The name, Moor, when translated into Latin, means death. And so, for their slogan, they chose the following, Moor Ionwe Vitae, which means death is the gate to life. Despite a slogan that would fit nicely on a mausoleum, French buyers lined up, selling over 200 cars by 1898. Their first race was in 1897. Emile himself drove their car in the Paris Deep race, along with two other drivers also driving Moore's cars. Emile placed seventh overall in the race. Next, Emile Moore's and André Michelin both each drove a car in the Paris Troville race, with Emile finishing twelfth. The following year, at the Paris Bordeaux race, Emile was driving his car and collided with a small wagon that was on the road. He was thrown from the car and broke his collarbone. He himself would not race again. 
More cars, however, would be all over the races. Some of their drivers being Camille Genatze, Henry Fournier, and Alfred Leve. And armed with his driving experience, Emil began to redesign the cars for one thing, speed. And in his view, bigger, stronger, and smarter was the key to success. He brought on a new engineer that he snagged from Panhard, Henry Brassier, to add his ideas to the equation. Suddenly, Moore's cars kind of looked like Panhard's. <laughs> Front engine, center line drive chain, that sort of thing. The engine size also began to grow from 2.7 liters to 4.2 liters. It was in late 1899 that Moore's took over the leaderboard of Grand Prix racing and stayed there for the next three years. At the Paris St. Malo, two Moore cars finished first and second. A Moore won the Paris Troville, and Moore cars came in second, fifth, sixth, and eighth at the Paris Ostend. The Brescia Sprint and the Brescia Cremora Mantura Verona Brescia were all won by Moore drivers. The last of the 1899 Grand Prix circuit, the Bordeaux Biarritz, Moore drivers finished first, second, and fifth. 1900 saw the emergence of the 7.3 liter 20 horsepower Moore. Gone was the belt transmission and horseless carriage look. This thing was a beast. It looked the part. A hood like a wedge, proper steering wheel, and a lower center of gravity than most contemporary cars. It also had a sliding three-speed uh, pinion transmission that drove the rear wheels through chains. And this car won the two biggest races of 1900, the paris toulouse paris race and the bordeaux pangue bordeaux race. Moore would continue to build bigger and bigger race cars and be the one to beat for the next couple of years. The men that drove them would become legendary in their time, and many would go on to make cars of their own. Moore was amongst the most successful cars of pre-World War I, and we definitely have more to say about them in the future. So if you're a fan of Grand Prix racing in its various modern forms, remember that the rivalries on the track all started with Panhard and Levisor versus more. Thanks for watching Vintage Car History, and we'll see you next week. Peace.